this year instead of making another resolution. Let's ask God to redeem our past, restore our present, rewrite our future, remain in Jesus. Let's ask God to renew. church family. So glad that you've joined us this morning and do want to ask you, how are your New Year's resolutions going? That may tell the story as to how they're going right now. You know, for for many of us, we make them. Sometimes we don't. I've gone back and forth years making resolutions, not making resolutions. But I do find it interesting that um, many statistics have been shared about New Year's resolutions and keeping New Year's resolutions. And so Um, 25% of people who do make New Year's resolutions stop or quit or fail at keeping them within the first week. So we're seven days in. If you still have kept your New Year's resolution, you're a part of the 75%. Like you keep going. Like you got it. If you make it to the first end of the first month, you're a part of a slim majority of about 10 to 15%. So it changes quite a bit in day seven through day 31. But if you're seven days in, you're doing it, congratulations, you're not like the other 25%. And if you're like the other 25%, that's why we talk about grace here at this church and forgiveness and second chances. And so don't give up on whatever it is. You know, for, for me, I, like I said, I've done it a couple in years past. I've made some. Sometimes I don't. Um, last year, like many of you, I did make a resolution to read through the New Testament part of our Bible in a year. And we had a, a Bible app, a plan that many of us followed along with through our YouVersion Bible app. And the nice thing about it was you read a chapter a day, but you always had the weekends to catch up. So if you missed a couple days during the week, you always had a little bit of grace to catch up. So that worked out well for me. And I was able to do that. And towards the end of December, right around December 30th, I was at the end of our Bibles, the book of Revelation, and read chapter 21. And these verses really just jumped out at me and reminded me of the work that God is doing in us. So Revelation 21, verse 3, it says this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So he who was seated on the throne, that's Jesus, said this, I am making everything new. That reality of there's no more pain, there's no more suffering, no more sadness, all things are new, all things are perfect, is a reality that as I was ending this past year looking ahead to the new year, I wanted that. I desire that. It's like, yes, that's something that I'm looking forward to. And yet... As the book of Revelation kind of lets us know that that is talking about a period whenever Jesus returns. But until Jesus returns, we live in this dichotomy. We live in this dual reality of experiencing this new life in Christ, this relationship with Jesus that redeems us and restores us to right relationship with God the Father. Yet at the same time, there's our own brokenness and sin and shame that that we bring into this life as well as is kind of put on us because of the brokenness and sin that's done to us or that is around us. You know, we we have a desire maybe to make new health style choices and have a better body and feel better about what we're putting in and, and how we're living, yet at the same time, our bodies are getting older every day and they're deteriorating and we, we wrestle with that. And so for, for me and for you and for us as followers of Jesus, we know that God is in the process of making all things new. That is his desire to make all things new. And yet we don't experience the fullness or the reality of that newness right now. So what do we do with that? Well, first I, I want to point out that Our desire as humans, especially around January, to make New Year's resolutions, to to move forward with something new, I believe speaks to our creator. 
It speaks to the heart of God. It speaks to his desire to make all things new. But I think it's more than that. That he's not just looking to do that someday in eternity, but he wants to do this renewing process in me and you and us and others in our world even today. And so that's what we're going to do in the month of January over these next four weeks. We're in this series called Renew. And we're going to be looking at this desire that God has that he's put in us to make all things new. But that word renew has a prefix at the beginning of it. The word or those letters R-E. And that prefix, what it means is again and again. So God is in the business of not only making things new someday in eternity when we see Jesus face to face. He wants to do this renewing process in us right now again and again, over and over and over again. That new life that Jesus has for us, he wants us to experience right now. And later on today, and tomorrow morning when we wake up, and tomorrow night, and when we go through hardships, and we go through pain, and we go through good times, he always wants to be doing a new work in us. And so in order for us to experience that renewing consistently that God desires for for us, we have to have his perspective about our lives. We have to have his perspective about our world. And his perspective is that the renewing happens when we look at our past, our present, and our future. And so when we look at our past, this is something that is kind of the impetus of starting New Year's resolution, right? 2023 happened, and as I step into 2024, there's something in my past that I want to change. There's something in my past that I didn't really like. There's a pattern I need shifted so that as I start this new year, things can look different. So we have to think back. We have to reflect on what has come. And then as we start the new year, we make a resolution in the present to say, I'm going to change some habits. I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to think a different way. I'm going to build relationships with different people this year. I'm maybe going to end some relationships. I'm going to eat differently. I'm going to set different fitness goals. Whatever it is, we, we make a decision in the present that will help us get to what? A different new version of ourselves in the future. I don't want to do all these things so that I end up like I did in 2023. I want to do these things so that my future looks different. See, we have to have that perspective because that is the perspective that God has for us when he is renewing our lives. He's allowing us and inviting us into embracing the new life, the best life that he has for us. He has a perspective of past and present and future. I mean, we see this in the the story of humanity and God creating the heavens and the earth. If you go to Genesis chapter one, verse 31, this is the past part of it. This is what God is doing. He, He writes this and it'll be up on the screen. It says, God saw all that he made, six days of creation, and he said it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. So that's something that that God did, and and where we see here in Genesis chapter 3, that was something then that happens in the past. Because in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve decide that they're going to take things into their own hands. They're going to eat from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And in that present moment, they ruin and destroy that perfect, intimate relationship that God has with them, that God has with humanity. So what God does then in that present moment is to say, hey, I'm going to do something different so that doesn't happen again. That that sin doesn't have rule and reign on humanity once and for all. And there's a couple things that he does. Number one, we know that he actually kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden. He says, you guys can't live in perfection anymore because if you eat of the tree of life and have eternal life with me, There's going to be sin and selfishness and shame in this relationship. And I'm not going to have that forever. I want perfection with my creation. So God has to look in the past and say, hey, we're going to do something different. You're not going to be allowed to eat of that. This relationship's going to have to look differently. 
But in that present moment, God sets out his plan to save and redeem not only Adam and Eve, but all of humanity. If you look at Genesis 3, verse 14, here's how he begins the plan of salvation. He says this, The Lord God said to the serpent, Satan, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, you will eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. We're not just talking about stomping a physical snake, though some of you do that when you do see a snake around you. Most other sane people will run away when we see the snake, and then there are the 10% of you that just go grab the snake and like, oh, look it, I got a snake. So, but what he's talking about here is a picture of a daughter of Eve, specifically Mary, mother of Jesus. And this is the first prophetic word from God about sending Jesus to this world to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, to rise again, to do what? To ultimately defeat Satan and sin and shame once and for all. In that present moment there in Genesis 3, God is saying, hey, we're going to change some things right now. So that what? So that the future looks different. So that I can be restored, you can be restored, we can be restored to right relationship with God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ alone, in his perfect life, his perfect death, and his resurrection. And so we see God throughout all of human history and continuing to make all things new. He has this, hey, this is what happened in the past, but we're going to change things so that our future goes back to how it should be. And so in our time together this morning, we're going to be looking at that aspect of redeeming the past. In the weeks ahead, we'll look at how God restores our present, how he rewrites our future, and how through all of this we do remain in Christ. But this morning, we just want to look at that one aspect of redeeming the past. And you can throw that up there. What does it mean when God redeems our past? It simply means this, is that he's making right a past mistake fault or wrongdoing. So something happened that was wrong. Something happened that shouldn't have happened. Something, well, a mistake was done. A a crime was committed. Whatever it was, and God says, hey, what, what shouldn't be, I'm going to make right. What shouldn't have happened in the past, I'm going to use that and bring about redemption so that the wrong can be made right. And we see Genesis chapter three, he says, hey, I'm going to give up myself. I'm going to give up my son Jesus to make this wrong right so that you and I can benefit from the relationship that God desires for all of us. But not only did he do that in that moment, we know because of Jesus's death and resurrection that we can be restored to that right relationship with God on a consistent basis, even when I sin, even when you sin, even when we fall short of God's perfect standard. 1 John 1, 9, it tells us this, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So we have full salvation in Christ, but there is also this daily wrestling match that we have inside between our sinful nature and the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit living inside of us. And there are things that we do and say and think that pull us away from God. And God says, hey, I can redeem what you did in the past so that you and I can be restored to the right relationship. I can, what you did that was wrong, I can make right as long as you what? Confess that. If you ask for forgiveness and God is faithful time and time again to show us grace and to show us forgiveness. And so for us this morning, our big idea that I want to share just in a, in a passage of scripture and a couple of examples, is this, is that Jesus redeems our past to bring new life. Jesus redeems our past to bring new life. There are things that, that we've done in the past that maybe we're ashamed of, or there are things that were done to us in the past that should not have been done to us. There was hurt and sorrow that we had to go through because someone did something that they shouldn't have done. No matter what has happened in your past, God is ready to redeem that 
over and over and over again so that you and I can experience new life today. And so we're gonna be looking quickly at the story of Joseph. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, um, Bibles are in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't have a physical copy of a Bible, we would love for you to take one home today. There are uh, English Bibles, Spanish Bibles on the back auditorium walls. We'd love for you to just take one home as a gift from our church to you. Feel free in your YouVersion Bible apps to pull up Genesis chapter 37. Um, and as you're turning there, just want to remind you here at Every Week at Avenue, we're going to teach from God's Word because we believe God has primarily spoken to us through His Word, the Bible. And not only do we believe God's Word is true, but that's very applicable to our lives today. And I hope that you do see that this morning. So the story of Joseph in Genesis chapter 37, Joseph is a character some of you know from reading, some of you know him because you've seen a, a play or a musical about a multicolored coat. And um, the, the long story short is that Joseph was the favorite of his 12 brothers and his dad gave him this multicolored coat that was very expensive to show that he was the favorite. So there was a sibling rivalry that was already there, but when you add the very expensive coat to it, it just brought it to a whole new level. Add on to that that the brothers had to be out in the fields watching the sheep and the cattle, whereas Joseph got to stay home. He was one of the youngest, and so he got to stay home with dad and kind of got treated differently than his brothers. And there were times that, that, that his dad, Jacob, would send Joseph out into the fields to check on his older brothers, to see how they're doing, if they're doing exactly what he had asked them to do. And what older sibling doesn't love their younger sibling to check in on them and go tattle to mom and dad to say, yes, they're doing what they should be doing or they're not doing, right? Any older siblings, you love that from your, no, not so much. They didn't like it either. And so it got to a place, though, there was a lot of contentiousness. There was a lot of family drama, to say it lightly. And so in Genesis chapter 37, verse 23, we read about one of those instances. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe that he was wearing, and they took him and they threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. So he's in a big hole about 15 feet down in the ground, 10 feet down the ground. He's not going to get up anytime soon. Verse 25. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, Judah's one of the brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? So come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. We shouldn't kill our brother, but let's sell him into slavery. We're so kind and compassionate and gracious. Verse 28. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and they sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who then took him to Egypt. And when Reuben, one of the oldest, returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. Sorry, that was just me reading, not for you guys, but that was verse 29. So there were some brothers who weren't a part of this plan. A lot of them were for it. And what happens over the course of Joseph's next 12 years is that he enters into foreign slavery. He becomes a slave in different high-ranking officials' homes. He gets promoted. He gets demoted. He gets accused falsely of different things, different crimes that he didn't do. He gets sent somewhere else. And he is hitting rock bottom time and time and time again. There, about year 10, something um, pretty miraculous happens. He's a, slave, he's a slave in Pharaoh's kind of home. Um, he's still in prison, but he is able to interpret a couple of dreams from God um, to some of the workers in Pharaoh's home. And he thought that that would kind of help him get out and Unfortunately, nothing happens. He stays in prison for a couple more years, but it's around year 12 that Pharaoh has these crazy dreams and no one's able to interpret them and he has no idea who they're coming from or why they're coming to him. And 
one of those workers says, oh, you know what? There's a guy in prison who interprets dreams. Let's see if he knows what's going on. And so in that moment, Joseph is called up before Pharaoh and he, through the power of God in him, through the spirit of God in him, is able to interpret these dreams of Pharaoh to him. He lets him know, hey, Egyptian is the, is the known empire. It's the world empire at this time. It is successful in everything. And for seven more years, it's going to experience great success and it's going to be prosperous. But then seven years after that, for seven more years, it's going to be terrible. There's going to be a worldwide famine and destruction is going to come. And so Joseph then gives the advice to Pharaoh, hey, in these first seven years of prosperity, let's save as much as we can, as much grain and as much resources so that it allows us to get through the following seven years of intense famine. Pharaoh likes that idea, and he promotes this slave boy of 12 years to second in command over the entire Egyptian empire. And so we, maybe you know from the story then that the seven years were prosperous and they save a bunch and then the seven years of famine come and Egypt, Egypt is able to be sustained because of Joseph's plan. But people outside of Egypt began to come to Egypt to receive grain and to receive food and resources and some of those people were Joseph's brothers. And it's in that moment that Joseph meets them and goes, has a little back and forth that um, he reveals himself to his brothers. He says, hey, like, <laughs> you're the one, like, I'm the one you threw in the cistern. Remember me? Like, I'm here. And instead of getting back at him, he shows them love and grace and compassion and care. And then he's able to be reunited with his father, Jacob, and um, save and preserve the nation of Israel as then those people began to live within the nation of Egypt. And at the end of Joseph's, this famine, and they kind of go back into a time of prosperity again, and his family is there with him. His father, Jacob, has just passed away. Joseph is having a conversation with his brothers, and Joseph has this godly perspective on the entirety of those 12 years, plus another 14 years, plus even many more years. And he says this in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He says, you brothers intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. It says, even though you wronged me in the past, you treated me poorly, my God was greater than all of that, and he was able to redeem that terrible thing in my terrible past in order to bring something good, to make something right so that more people could see the power of the one true God in their lives. You see, we have that perspective of God being able to redeem the past, because not only does he do that through Jesus Christ, but you and I can testify, as well as different stories within scripture can testify, of God making right different wrongs or difficulties or horrible things that were done so that we can embrace a new life, a better life, the best life that he has for us here on this earth. Does it mean that, that all the pain and the grief and the sorrow went away from Joseph because he saw God's plan of redemption? No, it didn't. But even in the midst of all of that, he was able to see that everything he went through was redeemed for his good, the good of others, and ultimately for God's glory couple of examples that we've seen in our lives. Some of you may know this, and we shared this on our social media accounts uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, we have a Mandarin-speaking uh, church that meets here in our building every Sunday at 2.30 uh, in the Student Center. The Hinsdale Chinese Christian Church meets there, and Pastor Juan has been leading that church uh, for several years. I, I came here in 2017, and the church was already meeting consistently um, so I think it's been over 10 years that they've been here. Someone can correct me if it's even more than that. But Pastor Wong shared a story with us because on Christmas Day, they had their church service. We had our Christmas Eve services. They wanted to have a Christmas Day service. So on that Monday uh, in the morning, they came here and they had a church service. And they were able to baptize a family. We can throw the picture of them up on the screen 
Um, it's a family that's, that's Jin Woo and his wife and three daughters and son. And uh, the three daughters, Jin Woo and his wife, were baptized on Christmas Day here. Um, like I said, our social media accounts, you can see all the pictures, and it's a pretty cool story. But I just want to read the email that Pastor Wong sent us and that we, we shared for everyone to read. He, he writes this. On Christmas Day, we baptized Brother Jin Woo, his wife, and his three daughters. Jin Woo and his wife suddenly lost the second of their three daughters about six years ago. Their second daughter died in Hinsdale Hospital after only several days of illness. And so weeks after losing their second daughter in 2017, in deep grief and sorrow, Brother Jin Woo and his wife and his two daughters at that time walked into our Sunday worship service to seek spiritual support. And they've now been attending our Sunday worship services ever since then. Brother Jin Wu at that time, soon after, accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And, and just a couple of years ago, um, he'd been praying that his wife and daughters would be ready to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And just recently in this year, um, they trusted in Jesus, and God even blessed them with another daughter and son. And after the, the daughters and his wife accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord, they also wanted to be baptized. And so on Christmas Day, we had the privilege of baptizing this family as they publicly proclaimed their faith in Jesus. You see, the tragedy of losing their daughter seven, six, seven years ago sent Jin Wu, his wife, and their two daughters on a spiritual journey of trying to make sense the wrong that happened, the brokenness, the trauma, the grief that they were um, going through. And though God is sovereign and he's in control of everything, he's not the author of sin, but in his sovereignty, he allowed this brokenness and this terrible thing to happen. He doesn't be the primary cause of it, but in the midst of that, he's able to redeem what had happened, the tragedy that happened. And because of the loss of their daughter, they stepped in and were able to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And one day, they'll be able to see their sweet little girl in heaven face to face because of her short life here on this earth. Amen. Amen. Last example. Many of you know, um, on Tuesday, um, I'm releasing my first book, which is pretty exciting. Um, yeah, you can clap for it. Thank you. Um, it's called Refined by the Fire, How to Process Pain, Regain Person, came and speak, <laughs> Regain Purpose, and Persevere After Being Fired from Your Church. I've shared my story up here many times. It was in 2017, that summer, it really in the spring, where I was let go from a position as a youth pastor at a church abruptly and unexpectedly. And in that season of, of trying to figure out what's next and what God is doing, God brought um, Myself and Maria and our kids here to Avenue, CCCH, <laughs> for old time's sake. And we, we came here as the youth pastor, and we were loved on and cared on and supported in a really difficult time in our lives. And um, God has been working in the midst of all of that. We're so grateful for this church family and the blessing that it has been to us in this season. Um, it was in that first year of being here that I wasn't really thinking about writing anything. <laughs> All I was trying to do was saying, God, this happened to me. I don't know why it happened. It feels very unfair. And yet I, I, I was really struck by what Peter had to write in 1 Peter chapter 1. He's writing this all to Christians who are being killed and persecuted all over the world. And uh, sorry, I don't have this up on the screen. It just hit me now that I wanted to share it with you guys. First and second John, first and second. <laughs> I, need my, I need my index. I'm missing it. I'll get it in a second. So there it is, first Peter. Oh my goodness. So first Peter chapter one, it, it says this. These have come, these trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And I remember reading that verse and saying, okay, 
Like, if I'm going through this, we're going through this difficulty right now as a family, you're going to make my faith stronger. You're going to refine it through the fires of trial. And so that I come on the other side. I can be more like you, Jesus. And so I, I began to wrestle with that, read scripture. That was my prayer. That was my desire. And I wanted to see it happen. And in the midst of all that, I'm journaling, I'm writing, I'm praying, I'm reading, journaling, writing, praying, read just on and on and on, on repeat again and again and again. And what God said in those moments, in those times is, hey, you need to be able to share this with others. This needs to be something else for those who have experienced this in ministry. You need to be able to write something that can help out a church who has experienced their pastor here one day and gone the next. You, you got to be able to do this and shepherd people through this and lead a staff in a different way. Like, this is not just for you, Kyle. This is for the good of others. And so six years, six and a half years later, almost seven years later, I get to share that. And I've been able to share that through talking with different people, through encouraging people. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity, that what I experienced in the past, what we went through in the past, God has been able to redeem and make new so that other people can be encouraged in their faith, so that other people can learn how to become more like Jesus when they go through their own trials. You see, God is in the business of consistently over and over and over again redeeming our past so that we can experience new life in him. He wants to do that every day. And so in order for us to begin that process, we have to be willing to look at the past. Many times when we make New Year's resolutions, we do look at the past for a hot second, and then we move on to what our future is going to be, right? And that with God, sometimes we got to be able to sit in the past a little bit. We have to have his, his glasses and his redemptive goggles to see, okay, this was done to me, or, or I did this, or I brought this on someone else, or whatever it is, and okay, God, now you're showing me how I can make something that was wrong right but we have to be willing to look back to see his redemption in our past. And so as we enter this new year, my encouragement for you is that if you are experiencing a new life reality, you're experiencing his goodness, you're seeing God's hand in your life, You've experienced his blessing in different ways. You're just, it just, you know, it just seems like you and God, you're on the same page. Things are moving forward. That's great. What got you there? That's what I want you to look at today. That's what I want you to look at this week. What were some ways that God was working in your past that allows you to experience this present new life reality? Because when you do that, it brings you to a place of gratitude. It brings you to a place of of praise to God. It, it humbles you and reminds you that you couldn't have done this on your own. <laughs> it's not by your strength, but by his strength alone that you were able to do this. And so that's what I want you to do today, this week, in the moment as we move into communion. Let's, let's, let's look back with those eyes of how does God work? How he's, has he redeemed? And I, I, just, I wrote down a few. I just want you to be thinking of it. Like, if you have stopped drinking to end the pattern of alcoholism in your family, that's great. How did God use that past to bring you here today? If you were broken up with or dumped or relationship ended and now you're experiencing a different relationship, well, how has God redeemed your past in that way? If you were downsized at your job, but now you have a different job, you were let go from one job and you're doing something else, how was God working and redeeming those past difficulties? If you personally made a mistake and failed, but now you've learned and now are doing something different or your life looks different because of those past mistakes, have you taken the time to thank God and praise God for how he was gracious and kind and loving to give you that second chance again and again? again. And the other side of the coin is this, is if you're in that place where maybe that present new life reality isn't what you'd hope it'd be. You're living in those 12 years of slavery. 
you're living in the moment of being in the fall and the consequences of that, well, can I encourage you today that even if our present reality hasn't been restored in the way that we had hoped for, desired for, that Jesus wants for us, we can be confident that even in what we're going through right now, there will be a time in the future that will be a present so that this time will be in the past and that God will be faithful to redeem whatever it is that we're going through in some way moving forward. He will. He's been faithful to do it over and over and over again. It is a part of who he is and his faithfulness and his character, and he is not going to stop redeeming the past. So if you're not there yet, realize you might be in a past for a future redemption. And Joseph had to have that mindset as he was going through a prison, right? Jesus, our Savior, when he's hanging there on the cross, and in a moment as the worship team comes out and we sing this song, Man of Sorrows, there were periods in Jesus' life where it felt like this is too much. God, how can you be working? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, he understands that. And so if you're there, believe in God's faithfulness for you. Believe in God's faithfulness for others. Be encouraged by the stories of those that have gone and seen their past redeemed and renewed and become more like Jesus. Because next week we're gonna talk about what does it look like when our present hasn't been fully restored to what we hoped it would be. And so I wanna just take a moment now, give you a time to reflect silently and then the worship team is gonna sing this psalm, Man of Sorrows, over us, and then we'll partake in communion together. Todd Zastra will lead us in taking communion. There's communion elements in the seat backs in front of you, a juice and a cracker. Um, you can hold on and prepare those elements, and Todd will lead us in taking that. But we believe that Jesus' death and resurrection is the thing that allows us to experience new life. It's the act in human history that allows our brokenness to be redeemed and restored and be renewed over and over again. So let us take this time now just to silently reflect. I'll pray, and then we can continue this time of reflection and prayer as the worship team sings over us. Oh God, you are a God of redemption. You are faithful always. You're kind and you're good. And even when things don't make sense in our lives, even when we're in the past and we can't see above the waters that engulf us, we know that you are redeeming, that you are working. And so we thank you for the new life that you give us in your son, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that we would resonate with your work on the cross, that it would impact us, empower us, and help us to see the redemptive work you are doing in us today. We thank you and we love you and we praise you. You are the only one deserving our praise. We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.